Egypt is you, my friend. I returned from a trip that lasted for two months, in which I sought comfort and well-being. Then I was visited by relatives and friends who visited me, and no sooner had our conversation begun in each meeting than the speaker detoured into a blatant complaint about what Egypt had become. Egypt collapsed, Egypt was over. This was the saying on every tongue of those who spoke, regardless of the topic with which the conversation began. The conversation may begin with aspects of our intellectual and literary life or it may begin with prices and how they flew in the sky, or with the invasion of Lebanon and the Fez summit, or with whatever you like of what people talk about and it is sent without affectation. That desperate tone was the same one I heard on the strings of the Egyptian expatriates whom I happened to meet during the two-month trip. Sometimes I felt sincerity and honesty in those conversations, just as at other times I felt lies, falsehood, and slander. I could only believe a patient who found skill in the Egyptian doctor, coupled with nursing neglect and the filth of the hospital. And I could only believe a researcher who found intelligence in the Egyptian student, coupled with explosive minds from the spirit of indifference and sabotage. Yes, I could not help but believe many things I heard, because I lived it and knew it, but at the same time, I could not help but accuse the speaker of violating the truth when I found the contradiction in his position blatant as if the speaker were a professor, doctor, or engineer who traveled to work in countries sister to Egypt or not, and their pockets were filled with thousands of dinars. There are hundreds of thousands of dirhams there and despite the fact that he is the one who holds for those countries the lamp of knowledge that he took from Egypt, or he is the one who treats the sick there, or plans the cities and establishes urbanization with medicine or engineering that went with him in his bags, you see him being proud of what he found there, and ashamed of what see it here. It was one of these strange cases among those who spoke to me that aroused my anger, so I exploded at the speaker, saying, My friend Egypt is you and it is me, and it is every Egyptian individual you see. If you want to talk about Egypt in an honest and free manner, then take Egypt as a whole, take it here on its land, then trace it wherever it goes, and wherever it travels in the regions of the earth, trace it in the people of the Egyptians who teach, heal, engineer, and rebuild the ruins, trace it in your own person, for what you are making where you are, and we are proud of making it, is Egypt embodied in you with its knowledge, its politeness, and its gentle nature. You began your talk my friend by drawing for us the ugliest pictures of Egypt's deterioration in this, and its collapse in that. So have you heard the legend that is told about a mighty genie, how he lived for an eternity, then his flame was extinguished and turned into ashes, so those with doubts thought that the time of the mighty genie had passed, and if with it from the ashes themselves his flame is kindled again, and that, my friend, is the story of Egypt's collapse and decline. In the field of education, for example, which is one of the most frequent examples on the lips of critics, have you heard before today in the history of Egyptian education? that tens of thousands of high school students achieve grades exceeding 90% every year. Stand here, sir, slowing down and contemplating and following with your imagination the fate of these thousands who have excelled in this way that rarely occurs in the fields of education wherever they may be. No matter how pessimistic you are, you cannot help but acknowledge that a huge number of those outstanding thousands will continue to have their superiority beyond university. From the very ruins of deterioration, individuals awaken to an unprecedented awakening, and then what? Then the giant emerges in his new mission and finds the road to his country blocked for a while. So he travels to carry out what I mentioned to you of education, medicine, engineering, and other things, so that the wasteland can be populated with his efforts. Among these builders was you, my brother. Have you forgotten? I know that in a few days you will return to your diaspora, so I ask you to look around closely and see Egypt and its children what it does and how it does it. On my last trip, I met an Egyptian friend with an excellent degree of culture. Among what I heard from him was that the Egyptian youth had lost confidence in Egypt and its culture. This is what my friend said in a tone indicating that he too had lost confidence. So I asked him, is what you are saying true? Are you serious when you claim that our youth have lost confidence in Egyptian culture? If he had claimed that to me, I would not have believed him, because his behavior then exposes his claim. So what is this Egyptian culture that you are talking about, and making me think that our youth have turned their shoulders to it? The culture of a particular country is based on the land of that country, and the hearts of the citizens are connected to it. This culture of Egypt is not a summer cloud that appears in the sky from time to time and then disappears, but rather it is in the constants, deep-rooted in the earth, seen by the eye, heard by the ear, and held by the hands. Are our youth today ashamed to see the pyramid, the Karnak temple, and the valley of the kings?
Are our youth today ashamed to see the monasteries of ascetics in the desert among which were the first monasteries known to Christianity in its history from its first centuries, or are they ashamed to see the mosques of the Prophet's family and the saints of God? Are our youth today ashamed to see El Azhar Mosque and know the role it played? Let us leave this ancient history behind and take a quick look at our modern history. What feelings I wonder would our youth feel if we mentioned before them a group of pioneers of modern Egyptian culture. Muhammad Abdul Qasim Amin, Lutfi Al Sayyid Taha Hussein Abbas Al Akkad, Dr. Haikal, Ahmad Shaki. Tafik Al Hakim, Nagib Mafuz. What feelings I wonder would our youth feel if they saw the statues of Mukhtar, the paintings of Muhammad Sayyid, and if they heard, um, Kultham and Muhammad Abdul Wahab. What feelings I wonder would our youth feel if we mentioned before them the revolutions of Arabi, Saad Zaglul, and Gamal Abdul Nasser. No, my friend, no Egyptian has lost confidence in Egypt even if he imagines that. I heard Mrs. Thatcher, the British Prime Minister giving a speech to her people to raise their morale. What she said was that Britain is proud of many things, and she began to give them examples. They were all scientific inventions, such as the refrigerator, the Concorde plane, and the like. So I asked myself as I was listening, what you say about Egypt if you were to address the people by mentioning to them its modern exploits and leave behind the exploits of several thousand years. I gave myself an answer that I was satisfied with, both with my mind and my heart. I say that it is Egypt gentlemen that was able, with its recent revolution, to instill a spirit of self-confidence among the working groups. He was the peasant and the worker almost did not feel dignity for himself before the landowner or the employer. The relationship between the two parties was the relationship of the superior to the inferior, the relationship of the master to the master. It became at least a relationship of two contracted equals if the workers did not have a rank above the others. So it was a coup that was not to be achieved without a revolution, you can consider it a page of contemporary Egyptian culture. Once again I ask, is it true that our youth have lost confidence in Egypt's culture? If he had done so, he would have denied the most important characteristics that made an Egyptian an Egyptian, and at the forefront of those characteristics is religious feeling. Egypt is the oldest country in the entire world that was filled with that religious feeling, and from the long period during which the Egyptian was imbued with his religious conscience, that conscience became part of his being as accompanied by the tan color of his skin. On this occasion, in the context of the conversation, I would almost claim that the characteristic that distinguishes a person as a human being is the characteristic of religiosity. It has become common among us that the mind is what distinguishes him. But if we analyze this reason to the end, we find a large common aspect of it between him and the rest of the animals, and as for the quality that you will not find in the oda of an animal, it is the quality of religiosity, and it is a quality that is more abundant in the Egyptian than in any other human being. Although I have insisted with all my might and I am still insisting on the necessity of our attention to the actual aspect of our lives, this is because it has diminished to a frightening extent. Then I go back and ask, have you seen our youth denying this characteristic of their Egyptianness? Oh God, no. What moved the tongues of slander and falsehood with these lies about Egypt flowing in their conversations with each other? and in what they broadcast and write. It's just one damn thing, the economic situation, and it's not a thing to be taken lightly. People above all else want food, clothes and shelter. But we confuse things grossly if we confuse the value of a person as a being with a history of civilization, science, literature, art, and religion, on the one hand, and the amount of money he carries in his pockets, on the other hand. Richness and poverty alternate, with one appearing and the other disappearing at a stage, and then disappearing. The apparent and the hidden appears at a later stage. A single event, such as the discovery of oil, changed matters overnight in many parts of the earth, which were the poorest parts yesterday and became the richest. The opposite is also true, as a country that is extremely wealthy may turn into a poor country as a result of war or other factors of transformation, but the quality of civilization is not something that is born overnight. Indeed, how quickly a person falls into error when he has mixed characteristics and resembles cows. Then the gentleness, gentleness, and sweetness of a civilized person may appear in his eyes as humiliation and submission. Whoever wants to know about the Egyptian in his apparent meekness, is it humility or gentleness of character, must analyze the culture of the Egyptian. Deeper and more precise to distinguish between what the Egyptian considers important in his life and what he considers to be a passing matter of little danger. Among the most important things in his culture are, 
his religious belief and his family and national affiliation. Here, if something bad befalls an Egyptian, you will see what a ferocious lion has emerged from the skin of that gentle, gentle person. As for what follows, I have been one of the most ardent critics of values, as they prevail today in Egypt, and whoever wishes may read my books, The Paradise of the Idiot A Sunrise from the West, The Earthly Comedy and others, but this is the criticism of the owner of the house who knows the preciousness of the precious carpet, so he erupts in anger, if he saw that it had disintegrated due to the negligence of its guards, 